help you uh, to, to explain what are you doing, right? So this is my almost my second year here in the United States. I'm doing my, my postdoc in UCSC Santa Cruz in the Ocean Science Department. Um, um, this I'm going to uh, I will present today an overview of my postdoc project entitled uh, "I Recently Discovered Symbiosis in the Ocean." So please be free to stop me in the middle of the presentation. I try to um, explain every scientist term, but if there is something that I didn't explain or you don't understand or for my accent, whatever, just be free to stop me and ask me, okay? I, I would be very glad to answer. So, like the title said, uh, symbiosis, but what is symbiosis? Uh, literally means, it's a Greek term that literally means living together. It's a long term, uh, in a long term means interaction between two different species. We always, um, we learn in the high school uh, all this kind of symbiosis. Um, we always imagine the symbiosis that this organism that we can see, for example, the, the um, the bee that pollinate the flower or the ants that live in the acacias and protect the acacia from other insects. Uh, the acacia uh, giving compensation and nectar to the ants. Or the remora that live in the, in the belly of the shark, eating all the parasites, um, uh, keeping clean the shark. And at the same time, the, the remora is, is mm, using the food of the leftover of the shark. So we always think about this kind of symbiosis that we can see with our eyes. But there are another, another kind of symbiosis that we've never seen. Uh, because it's very difficult to see, with it. we cannot, I mean, it's very difficult now, it's like a, we cannot see, at least that we use um, a powerful microscope. Um, so for example, the, the, the symbiosis that live in plankton, but what exactly are plankton? So here I show a single drop of seawater magnified 20 times, magnified 20 times, only single drop, and it's amazing, it's a whole life. Uh, here in the, in the drop. Um, there are a lot of like a tiny plants and tiny animals. Um, this is the plankton. This is um, all these tiny plants and animals that live in the water and they cannot swim like the whales and fish uh, do. They just drift. And actually plankton is another Greek term that means drifting. So they just drift along. Um, there are two kind of plankton. Uh, there is a phytoplankton and zooplankton. So the, the word phytoplankton, uh, this is plants, this is this kind of plankton is like plants and this is like animals, okay? So you know, came from animals. <laughs> so um, just to make an idea how, uh, how, much plankton, how much phytoplankton we have in the ocean, there is a over a million of phytoplankton fit in this tea spoon, so it's amazing how much we, fa we have in the ocean and we cannot see anything, at least that we use a microscope. Um, the, in the, we have to use a microscope for the phytoplankton, but there is some kind of zooplankton that we can use a, a magnified glasses, uh, we can observe. So today in this talk, I'm going to be focusing the phytoplankton because um, the symbiosis that I'm, I'm studying in the UCSC uh, is inside of this group. So like I said, phytoplankton is like the plants. So they do photosynthesis too. So they use the energy from the uh, sunlight uh, to turn CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, that is in the air and is in the water into sugar. Um, because they need this energy, they need this sun, they have to live in the upper water, they cannot live in the deep water. Uh, there isn't enough light for them in the deeper water to grow and survive. So why is important phytoplankton for us? Why? Who cares, right? So it's very important actually because like plants, they give off oxygen, so when they are doing the photosynthesis, they turn the carbon dioxide into sugar and they give off oxygen. So if you take a deep breath, half the oxygen that you breathe every day comes from the green plant on land. 
and the other half is bubbling out of all the tiny phytoplankton floating in your sea. This is the 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. It came from the phytoplankton. So I think this is very important, right, for us. So the, the phytoplankton provide most of the organic matter for the rest of the marine food web. As animal and as a plant, they live, they die, they poo, they, um, uh, they have carcasses. Um, so all these things sink down and down and down like the like a fall in a flake of a snow. And there is another animal, some plants behind that they are going to take these nutrients and they are going to break down and um, they are going to push all the leftover and the carbon dioxide out into the deep water. Later, the currents, they are going to take um, all this water that are rich of nutrients and a carbon dioxide, and they are going to thrust to up, like uh, all the way back, up to the upper water again. And the phytoplankton that there is in the upper water, they are going to take again this nutrient. So anything, and nothing goes to waste. It's everything like, it's a cycle, okay? Nothing goes to waste. And with this, uh, with this fight, uh, with these nutrients that came from the currents, um, with enough light, the phytoplankton can grow very, very fast. Um, just to to give you an idea how uh, fast can grow, it's like a, in one day, one phytoplankton can grow and became two just in one day or so. So you imagine a billion or billion of phytoplankton in another day, next day, you have another billion and billion. It's, it's amazing how they, they grow so fast. The air that, that we breathe in is made up of 78% uh, of nitrogen. 1% of argon and 21% of oxygen. So there are a lot of uh, nitrogen in the atmosphere, but there is also a lot of nitrogen in the, in the water because this nitrogen is going to diffuse across to the sea surface into the water. Um, this nitrogen is going to transform um, to another form of nitrogen. So all this process that one form of nitrogen uh, transform to another form of nitrogen. All these cycles is is the, is called the marine nit uh, nitrogen cycle, and this is very important because the nitrogen is um, the all the nucleosides, the DNA and RNA that is in our cells and the proteins is everything made with nitrogen. We need this nitrogen. is is very important, but no all nitrogen is available to organism, which is why agriculture are, feel, are fertilized. Um, here, for example, we show, uh, this a little blurry, this picture, but we can see a, a plants with nitrogen and a plant without nitrogen, and we can see that the leaves rapidly became pale green. So we need, the, the plants need, and the phytoplankton need the, the nitrogen, right? Um, Similar to the to the agricultural field in the ocean, fixed nitrogen is one of the most important growth limiting nutrients for photosynthetic organism. We cannot fertilize all the ocean, right? But there are there are some um, phytoplankton, phytoplankton that uh, they can fix nitrogen. This is some cyanobacteria that they have this ability to fix nitrogen by the nitrogenase enzyme. But why do we care? Why is the nitrogen fi uh, fixation important? So like I said before, um, the phytoplankton is the first of the food chain, right? Um, they, if, uh, if, and they need nitrogen. So this is in turn controls how many fish, whales, and other animals can live there since phytoplankton are the base of the marine food chain. And it will also determine how much carbon dioxide that's part of the ocean uh, sucked down from the atmosphere. There is a sentence that I like a lot that say, you wouldn't think that putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere would change the amount of nitrogen available to fish in the ocean. 
but it clearly does. And it is important to realize just how interconnected everything is. So just to sum up a little, I said that there is, I'm studying a symbiosis that uh, take a part of uh, the plankton, and the plankton can be a phytoplankton, and so plankton that is the animal, and the phytoplankton that is like the plants, uh, they do photosynthesis too as well, and there is, inside there are some of cyanobacteria that fix nitrogen. So one of these cyanobacteria that can fix nitrogen is the is the is the cyanobacteria that I'm studying right now. So this is very specific. So this is my project. The name is Candidatus atelophenobacterium thalassa, but we call it using a thanks God. Um, the, this is 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 with a symbiosis with another host that the name is long to so spread a little further we go away. But today we are going to call it host. Okay, so it will be using a and host. Um, but how was detected the first time this cyanobacteria? Because it's very small and we need microscopes to see how it was detected. So the first detected was in 1998 by Jonathan Sir, a professor of ocean science in UCSC. That is my boss, uh, and he's here. So <laughs> uh, they designed in this article um, an approach to measure the diversity of the nitrogen fixing microorganism using this nitrogen scheme. This sounds very bad right now, but I'm going to explain, okay? So, like, the, like we have family, the microorganisms have family too. So, we share, uh, it's at the same, similar that we have some DNA that is similar to our daughter or father or mother, in the microorganism is the same, they have family and they share some, they have some in DNA uh, allele in common too. So the nitrogen gene is very, very similar, it's highly similar. So in this article, they took this gene that is very similar uh, in all the cyanobacteria that can fix nitrogen. So w this was the process, the, the, in, this was the method to detect more cyanobacteria that can fix nitrogen. So here, for example, I, I show the, the, the typical family tree that everyone does uh, with the daughters and parents and grandparents. And here I show a family tree of UCNA of my cyanobacteria. They have a family tree and, and uh, this is the way that we plot and uh, we represent this family and how are close each other. Uh, so thanks to this method, uh, a few years ago, it uh, was detected three sisters of UCNA, okay? Um, these three sisters are global distributions, and uh, thanks to uh, one Spanish uh, group, we know now that they are widespread and often coexist each other in the same water, these three sisters. But this cyanobacteria is, is unusual because um, lacks a lot of genes which are present in a common cyanobacteria. So this is a normal uh, cyanobacteria and all this red cross, this is the gene that these cyanobacteria don't have. So how is possible, and um, there are a lot of genes that carry out the photosynthesis, how is possible that this cyanobacteria can live? How work? Um, so the answer is because they, they live in symbiosis. Um, so they live in symbiosis, and in in the cell lab uh, a few years ago, Anne Thompson and Rachel Foster they demonstrated like there is a symbi uh, there is a um, nutrients exchange. So the host give carbon to the cyanobacteria, and the cyanobacteria, like I explained before, can fix nitrogen, give nitrogen to the host. So there is a exchange. It's a mutualism. It's like a they both win. Okay, they 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 have the nutrients that they want. Um, but still, we have a question that is uh, one of the objectives of my project, that is how this cyanobacteria can work if it is lack the essential metabolic pathways, how, how she can live. And we know that this is a symbiosis, symbiosis, but they don't have the most of the gene that unusual cyanobacteria have, so how, do, how she does that? So, we, um, we, to try to answer this question, uh, we determine the gene expression of UCNA. But the next question is what, what is gene expression, right? So 
we know, okay, that the bodies are uh, made up of cells, and the cells run on a set of instructions spelling out in DNA. So the DNA has a lot, has thousands of genes, but they have the instructions to do the protein. That actually the proteins is like a building blocks for the cells. So everything we need, everything is connected. Okay, without uh, the DNA, without the protein, without the cell, we we cannot exist. So this is very important, and the genes is the is like a destruction for making protein. So the gene expression that is what I'm studying is the process um, how a gene make. A, a protein is is this structure actually it's like a, I'm studying the structure of the cells or something like that to understand in other words. Um, so when when a gene is on and its protein is being made, scientists say that the gene is being expressed. So you imagine that you have the electricity in your home, okay, and if you don't switch on you are not going to have light, right? You always have electricity there. But if you don't switch on, you are not going to see the light. So this is exactly the same. Electricity is the genes, and the light is the protein. So if you don't switch on, you are not going, the, the gene is not going to make the protein. So the on and off state of all of a cell's gene is known as a gene expression profile. And each cell type has a unique gene expression profile. So when measure gene expression? So changes to that expression profile indicate something is happening. So do you imagine with the cardiograph, okay, uh, when we, we are in the hospital, the cardiograph, they tell you how healthy is a, is a person, right? If it's, uh, it's the profile is, is nice, you know, he's okay. If it's like a, he's having a heart attack like me today with the talk, they are going to be a little different. So this is exactly the same. This is just measure, see the profile of the gene, and if it's something different, something is happening. But how relevant is the gene expression? So it doesn't tell us everything, but it tells us a lot of more than we knew before. It's just a leader, it's, it's a baby step to know more. It's, it, this is the first step. Um, we have to start later to study the proteins and we have uh, to continue. This is the first step. And we learn a lot with the gene expression. So, you know, my objective is to study the gene expression of UCNA. But to study UCNA, I need UCNA, right? And it's in the water, it's in the ocean, so I have to sample. And this is the worst things, you know, I have to go to Hawaii, I have to go to Maldinas maybe this year. Um, this is awful, and I, I don't like it. I go because my work has to, I have to do it, right? Um, but uh, this, is, this is really nice, actually, and I like it a lot. Um, so this is a, this platform, uh, we call it Rosette. Um, I have a lot of bottles. This is the way how we collect the water. So this is remotely, um, remotely um, 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 connected. To, uh, so if, for example, uh, you want um, you want ten liters in the you want ten liters for you. <laughs> Uh, you have you want 10 liters in 100 meters. So we are going to open a bottle with a, with the computer. Okay, it's everything remotely connected. So we are going to open a bottle in 100 meters to take 10 liters. We are going to open another bottle because I want two liters in 10 meters. I'm going to open the other. So it's going. It's open and close the bottle, whatever liter that we want, whatever depth that we want. And all these um, rosettes have a lot of sensor that the name is CTD, that is Conductivity Temperature uh, Depth, this acronym. Um, so they are going to measure all the water property in a real time. This is a really nice uh, way because we know we want to know how all cyanobacteria are, right? Um, so everything has to be secure in the cruise and ready for transit because um, 
So you see here I have uh, ropes in the machine and everything have ropes for the boxes because you're working at the same time that the, the cruise is moving. So you have to have everything everything secure because if not, it's going to fall everything. And this is the, the thing that happened when you don't when you don't have this, is is this that was my room in a storm in Atlantic. I forgot to put a a rope here in the driver and was like a hurricane in my in my room. It was awful. So you have to be always very uh, everything secure and you have to have protection always. The helmet, the boots, because um, it's 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 um, it's a little. Um, dangerous is if you're going to work you know outside of the cruise of the ship um, this is um, how we do some experiments so this is an incubator that is just uh, a place where we put here the, the, the samples and so, uh, this is a bottle of water and we can change the temperature we can change the light we can add nutrients whatever you are interested in to do it and this is a really nice experiment that I, I saw the first time last year in Hawaii. I never seen and I want to share with you because it's really, for me, it was really interesting. So they take water um, from one depth and later they put in a bottle. And they are going to do the experiment that they want, that they are interested in. For example, adding a nutrients, adding phosphor or whatever. They add the nutrients, they close the bottle, and they are going to leave it in the same depth again with a GPS and with a, bu a, a buoy, sorry. So you, uh, they are going to have the same condition. It's, they are going to have the same temperature. They are going to have the same light, the same everything. The only difference is the nutrients that you add. So it's, the, it's a perfect way to see what is going on, right? Um, and for example, you, the, 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 the ship can leave and one day later when you are interested to pick up the, the sample, uh, you look for with the GPS where are your bottle and pick up with a towel. So this is um, so sometimes we don't need we don't need a ship because we can we need for example uh, we are interested to to sample in a coastal water instead of sampling in a open water. So we just use the traditional mechanism that is a baguette. Um, we go to the pier. Um, we would take uh, water with a rope. Um, sometimes we have a, spe a spectator, like a sea lion here. Um, they were very angry that we were there. Um, sometimes a daughter came to help us. This is, <laughs> this is really nice. Um, actually, this uh, was in the script in La Joya in San Diego. Um, um, the sample that the, the result that I'm going to show today is uh, from this water from San Diego. We have to sample in every three hours, and we have every three hours for three days. So it means like we couldn't sleep, and we have to go to the harbor with the flight light at 3 a.m. It was a little scary actually. Um, but this is science, and we love that <laughs> actually. Sometimes one day you go to the pier and come back. Another time is a little longer, two months. Um, I was in a cruise crossing of the Atlantic uh, for two months. They got from England um, landing in, in Chile. Um, you don't see anybody, only the people that is in the ship. We didn't stop. We, we didn't have internet actually in one month, so we couldn't talk with our family. Was a little, it was very hard because everything is working, but it was really nice. It was like a big brother in a ship. Um, and actually, I, I'm going to, to, to show how is the life at sea, because it's, it's really nice. And I have a video for you that I hope that you can listen. I'm going to put the microphone here, the speaker. You've probably been wondering how we live on board the ship. Jamie Becker from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution will explain a bit about our lifestyle at sea. Alright, so it's another beautiful day on the Melville. We got blue skies and blue water. And, you know, you've heard a lot about the work that we're doing out here, the science that we're doing, and we are working really hard, working around the clock to get our experiments and our projects completed. Um, but there's more to life at sea than just work. You know, at the end of the day or at the end of an experiment, we don't get off the ship, uh, we don't go back home or, or to a hotel or anything like that. We're really on ship all, all day long, all night long. Um, so we're living on board. Uh, that means that we eat on board, we get uh, three square meals a day, we've got breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, 
plenty of food, more than we could ever eat. Uh, there's vegetarian options, salad bar, we've got fruit, we've got desserts. Uh, the cooks do a great job in the galley giving us the food that we need to keep us going to get the experiments done. Uh, if you're not eating, sleeping, or working, there are some other things that can keep you busy. Uh, we've got some board games, card games that people play. Uh, we actually have two TVs on board, a DVD collection, you can watch a movie. Uh, there's also a ship's library where you can grab a book, sit outside and read on a nice day like this. Um, we've got email on board. Almost all the time we have an internet connection where we can uh, stay in touch with our friends and family back home, let them know how things are going, let them know that we're safe. Uh, so all in all, you know, we are we really are living on board like one big family and the ship's crew does a great job of making ship life as comfortable as possible, <laughs> giving us everything that we need to keep us going so we can get the work done and have a successful and a safe cruise. What about where we sleep? Nicole Pereira from the University of California at Santa Cruz will explain. So, we're in my stateroom right now, and a stateroom is just another word for a ship's bedroom. And it's kind of like a dorm style room, so there's a set of bunk beds, and you share with one other person, and usually you flip a coin for the modern bunk. <laughs> and each of us has a set of drawers and a locker to put our personal items in. And there's, you can, you know, put your laptop and whatever, whatever personal stuff you have around and come in to just mostly sleep, but you can watch a movie and relax in here as well. Um, there's a sink, and there's also a head, which is the bathroom, and it connects two different staterooms, so it's shared. Um, one of the important things about just sharing a stateroom with somebody else is that you want to make sure that you're conscientious about the noise level, just coming in and out at different times, you know, you're working different hours, so your roommate might be sleeping, and that's another thing that you want to remember, because there are state rooms all around the ship, so when you're going um, different levels, wherever you are, you have to be aware that someone's probably sleeping in one of those rooms at any given time. Um, but other than that, it's really comfortable in your room, and it's um, pretty much your home, away from home for a month. So, you get used to it. <laughs> so, she, uh, she's doing a PhD in the same lab that I'm working right now, Nicole Pereira. Um, in this ship, for example, they have internet, I didn't have it, but um, this, is, this is really nice. Um, the food is amazing in the, in the ship. Uh, so, okay, so we have the sample, okay, and my objective was measure the gene expression, but how we are going to measure the gene expression. So, using microarray, what is that? So, this is a chip, okay, uh, that have the, the DNA complementary of your samples, in other words. So, this is the, the DNA that is like a zipper, so this is like a two side of a zipper. So, the chip has one side of a zipper, and we add in our sample, the other side of the zipper with a fluorescence. So when they are going to find each other, they are going to connect and they are going to emit this fluorescence. So the data is presented with a color scale. And with this methodology, is, uh, we can measure thousands of genes at the same time. Just to make an idea, I, I measure a two whole genome of two sisters of UCNA with, the, with only one microarray. It's amazing how, how much genes we can measure. Um, here I, I just show a, a graph that here the, the blue means the low expression, so when the genes are off, just to remind that is like the, the, the electricity and the lights when you we shoot on is when we are going to see the light and we are going to have the protein. So this is a, when it's off the blue and the red is when it's on. So here we can see that these all these genes are on, are expressed, like I explained before. And all these genes are not spread, are off. Um, there is um, another interesting thing here that uh, we can see that with the sun, okay, we're uh, on all this gene, and with the dark, we're during the night, we're sleeping, they weren't off. And there is a, just a few of genes that were expressed during the night, so they were on during the night, and off during the day, it was opposite. Um, 
I'm not going to show you the 2000 genes uh, and all the profile expression uh, because I don't want to do a slip, but I'm going to show you only two. Um, this is a, I'm going to show you both behavior, one when it's on during the day, another one is on during the night. So here, for example, I show a, a carbohydrate sporin. That what is that? Is that, you know, the, the purine that we have in the skin, when we, for example, we sweat are open because to eliminate the, the water. This is exactly the same. It's just like a, a, little, a little bus that transport sugar from out of the cell to inside of the cell. Um, when they want, they close, and when they, when they don't want, they close, and when they want more sugar, they open, okay? So we observe a high expression during the night in this gene, and was not, was not on during the day. So we were thinking that maybe this gene is involved with the nutrients exchange with the host, because I, like I said before, that the host give carbon to the cyanobacteria, and the cyanobacteria give nitrogen to the host. Maybe this protein is, is involved. We don't know, but we are studying because this is very interesting. And there is another um, gene, this is the nitrogen fixation, nitrogenase, okay, that we can see that is on during the day. And I didn't discover this. <laughs> it was, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, papers before that they demonstrate that in this cyanobacteria they can fix nitrogen during the day. And this is just agree with this, all this report because we can see that the gene, uh, uh, the gene is on during the day. So just to make a, a, a big a conclusion because uh, I, I don't want to bore you with everything, every gene, but a big conclusion, thanks to this methodology, we know a little more about how using a use light to create energy for the cell. Um, I'm actually, I'm writing an article uh, right now to publish all this data. But there is another objective that I am I'm working on in my projects, and is how do this uh, symbiosis look? How different are these sisters? They are twins, they are similar, or they are different? So, because I didn't show you any picture still, you don't know how it look, right? So, we wanted, uh, there was um, the uh, Spanish group, the same Spanish group, um, they used this methodology for first time in, in, the, in the symbiosis, in all cyanobacteria that we are studying. Um, the, the cyanobacteria is, uh, we are going to see with the red, and with the host, we are going to see green, okay? This is the host, and this is the cyanobacteria in red. This is one sister, and this is the other sister. Um, the, the, this technique, the name is Carfis, but um, this is methodology is kind of similar theory, like the microarray is like a zipper, uh, so one side is going to have the fluorescent, and another side of the zipper don't have it, and when they are going to find each other, they are going to give out this uh, fluorescence, so, we can see this fluorescence under the microscope. So we need something like that because I showed you how see, uh, the, the single drop, how many things we have. Um, we have to know what symbioses are, right? So, so we set up this protocol uh, in the lab and uh, we can see now the, the three sister. Um, so here I show you using A1, using A2 and using A3. And in the green, in the same that before, is the host. Uh, this is the fluorescence of the host. And the red is the fluorescence of the cyanobacteria using A. And the, the blue is just all DNA. So if we are going to uh, stay with blue, all the sample, we are going to see everything in blue because we have so many things, so, much, so many bacteria in the water. So everything will be blue. We have to use this fluorescent red and green to try to identify what symbiosis is are. So, so here we can observe that using a one half a, is, is just one cell and one cell of the host. It's one host and one cell together. We don't know how they are connected to each other. We don't know these connections, but they are together. And the size is a one between three 
in a one in, in using a one and the sister using a three. So they look like twins because they, they, they have the same size and everything. But in the case of using a two, I think that this is not twins. This is another it's another sister but it's a little different. So the the house is longer, it's bigger, it's between seven and ten microns. Um using a two we don't have only one using it, so this is a really nice. Uh, we have a lot of using it too. We can hear counts like a one, two, three, four, five, and they look like that this inside of like a bag or pocket or whatever, all together. Um, so this is really nice. We don't know how, why why this happened, um, and we don't know how if this pocket is inside of the holes or they are attaching each other. We don't know. We continue working on, but here I show uh, a 3D movie that I made, and um, so we can we can observe here all these blue things. It's another microorganism that there is the sample. Remember, the blue is the DNA, so we can observe everything here. But the the in the in red, I'm going to play a game. Sorry. In red, we can see the amounts of using a2 that there is inside okay there are a lot of cells inside um, um yes yeah, so, so we are we are very interested in this technique because they can tell us a lot um the conclusion for this objective uh, is that this technique showed that the host and the cyanobacteria using a have different size and also different numbers of using a cells per host this the, the the sister are different each other um we wanted to continue using this technique because, like I told you, show us a lot. But how is cell division coordinate, for example? Because we have one cell and of another cell of the host together. Um, we don't know uh, in the using a two they have a pocket of a lot of cells together. We don't know if the host uh, divides first, if the using a divides first or uh, how is this pocket dividing, we don't know anything. So I just sampling every three hours in Hawaii, um, the same that I did in La Jolla, um, to try to see how, um, how is this, how is the cell division. And I'm going to show you just a preliminary picture uh, because I'm working, I'm still working on that. Uh, but here I show before the sunset, we found to using a one per host and to using a two per host. Um, this is this. Uh, I observed that only before the sunset. Um, actually, we compare with the gene expression. We go back to the gene expression data we we have at 3 p.m. I found a high gene expression of a lot of genes that are involved in the cell division process. So this is kind of uh, everything is connected. Everything everything fits. The gene expression is, is high at 3 p.m. and later we are going to start to see how they are dividing. So this is this is really nice how this method um, connect and we can use this. And um, this result suggests that the cyanobacteria grow and division occur prior to the host cell division because we didn't see any host dividing. We only see at least the using a dividing. But I'm I'm continuing working on that. So just to, to finish I wanted to um, to, to, to show that there is a book for children, sorry, there is a book, <laughs> there is a book for children that the name is Ocean Sunlight, uh, that is uh, Penny Tilson is one of the writers that uh, she discovered another uh, cyanobacteria actually, and this is really helpful for the kids to explain what is the phytoplankton or how uh, the world is the phytoplankton and why this is important, and there is a, a web, see more, but they have a lot of games to, for kids and they have uh, um, games to identify the cell plankton. It is really nice and very helpful for the kids. Finally, I just want to say uh, to thanks to my all the, the lab where I'm working. Uh, Hannah Fanelli, is a postdoc from Sudan. Um, uh, Katie that is here and Brie that is here too. Thanks for coming. They are doing the PSD. Irina Shilova is from Russia and she's here too. Uh, Kendra and Mary Yogan, they are in Hawaii right now because they, they were in a cruise uh, for two weeks. Nicole Pereira that appears in the video that I, I showed before. My boss Jonathan Sir that is here too. Thanks for coming and his parrot that is not here but I don't know the name. Um, <laughs> and that's it. Thank you so much.
you. Yes, can we, anything? Um, so how much, like just kind of, I don't know, not like hard numbers or anything, but how different is this particular cyanobacteria that you found than like I didn't other, found, uh, other what's my boss? <laughs> that you guys have identified, um, because you said it was missing a lot of genes um, that are normally found. Is that like really, really striking? And so it's like, whoa, what is this? It's one of the cyanobacteria that fix more nitrogen in the ocean. So to make you, my boss is going to answer. Yeah. <laughs> there's, only, there's only one other that has been discovered. Okay, that has like, um, comparatively hundreds, so different. Hundreds of species. Huh. And they have the same like profile um, rhythmically, like with their circadian rhythms, with the light and darks compared to other cyanobacteria. They didn't do it yet, so we don't know. She said the gene gene profile of the other cyanobacteria. Okay, it's complicated. Your question is about whether like do the same peaks of genes. Happened, yeah, with, with light with, with day. Regular yeah. No, it's not the same. Because most most cyanobacteria would like this would be something very different. Okay, so they would fix so nitrogen like at night. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Oh. Or they have protection. It's it's a little more complicated um, this because um just um a leader to tell you this nitrogenesis um is uh, inactivated with the oxygen. So they have a lot of protection for the oxygen. So this this is a, a we are a cyanobacteria. They they fix nitrogen and you know the oxygen is with the photosynthesis like I told you before. So this is during the day, but because they cannot do photosynthesis, so they don't have they they are not going to have this oxygen that in, inhibits the nitrogen. Is. But we don't know how protect this nitrogen is from the oxygen from the host. Yeah, cool. it's, it's it's really we are um, a nice. Alex. I was curious, I mean, first of all, very, very good presentation. It was uh, pretty interesting. I'm not familiar at all with, uh, with uh, your field, so as you know, working in agriculture, but it is a pretty interesting uh, research and I learned a lot. But I'm kind of curious about uh, how is the distribution of uh, your cyanobacteria in the ocean and how do you, when you go on this uh, trips to do sampling, so what is the criteria that you use to choose this spot versus that one and versus that one? So it's a, it's a very good question. So there are a lot of people that they measure the abundance of this cyanobacteria. And we know now, um, I, I showed you before a map that the Spanish group, they, they measure the abundance of this cyanobacteria in a lot of parts of the world. And there are more people that they are working on that. Uh, so, and there are people that measure to if there are more in summer, more in winter, what month is months, there are more abundant. So we know it's 